Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to begin this morning's study with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the time that we have this morning uh, to open your word together. We are thankful, Lord, for the light that, that shines upon us. And um, we pray, Lord, that as we go through these studies, uh, the things that we we learn that we will be able to share with one another, that we will understand them and be able to present them. We pray, Lord, that uh, you can be with each person uh, who is studying these things and that uh, we can understand this truth for the present time, that it will give us light for our feet. Thank you for all the blessings that we receive, and may your Holy Spirit be with us now. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. So um, we have a little bit of work cut out for us today. And uh, Heidi and I went through this yesterday. Now, what, what we have here is yesterday's work, taking... Uh, Looking at Othniel, but we haven't we haven't addressed all of the details of this. Here, I have to make this a bit bigger. <clears throat> so what we we've what we've done is we've seen that Othniel, Ehad, and Shamgar are part of are the the arrival of the first angel's message in the judges line. So we have the judges line there. We can see that we have all of the judges represented on a line and it goes from 9-11 to 2023 and then we can say Othniel, Ehud and Shamgar are going to be a line in and of themselves and that line is is going from 9-11 to 2014 so it's covering that history and then we just look at Othniel himself as a line and Othniel, we understand, represents the Holy Spirit. And we're going to look at that a little bit more. But one of the things that we saw when we looked at um, the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and, and also Joseph, is that these lines, um, when you zoom into a waymark and you get another line, that line doesn't necessarily begin there. It, it could end at that first waymark. It could be leading up to it. And uh, sometimes maybe the middle way mark of the line might be um, the way mark that we zoom into. <clears throat> but here, my suggestion, so this was my suggestion, is that Othniel, when we look at Othniel as a separate line, that this arrival of the third angel's message, the arrival of this third way mark, or the, the seventh way mark, I guess, would be 9-11. Now, there are different ways that we can look at this. We know that this line here of 9-11, uh, we, we understand this to be 9-11 as the empowerment of the first angel. And, and again, you know, we, we've struggled with how to look at this. So even when we go here to this judge's line, um, if we're going to look at uh, this history, because we know 9-11 has two separate um, waymarks, depending which line you're on. And I'm still, I'm still not 100% certain in my mind how to separate these lines out. But when we look at, um, how could we do this? Okay, let's, let's go through this again, because I want to understand these layers. And so we're going to go to the whiteboard. That's probably the easiest. We're going to go through these arguments again.
and I did not. So the main line above this has to do with Millerite history. 1798. Then you have the second angel's message and the third angel's message, 1844. And then you have uh, this Sunday law waymark. <clears throat> and we can see that our line, you know, going from 1989, 9-11, 9-11, midnight, and midnight cry, that this line here that we have leads up to the Sunday law. Right? So this is, this is Alan White's line. She just sees the Sunday law is coming. That's Revelation 18. In her mind, right? Then the loud cry, then the close of probation, and the things that follow after that. But our line leads up to the Sunday law. So then we take our line and we lay it out. And so in our line, we got 1989. And then we're going to have 9 um, 11. And so 9 11 in our line. Again, we're going to have, this isn't lining up perfectly with above, but we got two 9-11s. And so this created this confusion because we bring these together. That's, that is, that's what Jeff did. He brought them together and said that this is the arrival of the first angel and also the empowerment, or the other way, the, arrive, the empowerment of the first angel, the arrival of the second. And then we would have these way marks, midnight and the midnight cry. instead of a loud cry, and then the Sunday law. But originally, you know, and then we're going to still have the loud cry afterward and the close of probation. So we can see that these are actually two separate lines. This line here that we run into this is not, this is not one line, right? Because this line is part of Ellen White's line. So this here is actually should be dropped down and separated out from this line. Does that make sense to people? But even here, we have two different 9-11s. And so we, we can do this, but we need to recognize that we have two separate lines. So when we have, if we're going to draw this line with 9-11 uh, being the empowerment of the first angel, if we did it the way that Jeff did it, so first he's going to have 1989. So 1989 is the time of the end, right? It's going to be the first angel arrives. And then what are we going to have next? So we're going to draw this line in a bit more detail. So what do we have next? What do we have as the formalization? So you have a formalization of the message. What is that? What year? Ninety-six. Okay, so it's 1996. Now you can see that in 1996, what is this, the Time of the End magazine, addressing? 
Why is this the formalization of the message? What's the message? What's the light? Because we have an increase of light here. And what is the increase of light? Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. Okay, so this is Daniel 11, 40 to 45. Okay, now this is really about the time of the end, right? Mm -hmm. So the time of the end magazine. So it's addressing this period of darkness. So what is the period of darkness specifically that Jeff is addressing? This is the period <clears throat> that the church needs to be awakened because it has forgotten its prophetic foundations. Okay. Right. So when he starts to address the time of the end here, and Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, he's actually going to begin addressing this history. Correct. So we're in the fourth generation. The fourth generation does not understand the first generation. The fourth generation does not understand the first, second, or third generation. Amen. Yeah, yeah, the fourth generation is in darkness, but it, it's forgotten the prophetic foundation. Mm -hmm. Right? It's forgotten the foundation of the message. That is, Seventh-day Adventist in this here, history, which would include... You know, people like me, because I'm an Adventist in 82. Um, we don't know anything about Millerite history. We don't understand the prophecies. We don't understand the 2300 days, how we came to that understanding. When we read in the spirit of prophecy, we miss what she's saying about all kinds of things. Just like New Testament scholars, when they're reading the New Testament, who never study the Old Testament miss all kinds of things that are being say, said in the New Testament. That is, they, they try to read it, but they don't have an understanding. And that is Adventism. Adventism is in darkness regarding this history here, 1798 to 1844. Now, Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, how does it address that history? Because in Jeff's mind, he's just looking at the Sunday law, right? That's what he's focused upon. But why, why does it, why does this message here address this message here? Chiastically, wouldn't this be a repeat and enlarge? Okay. Um, I don't know about chiastically. Um, I don't, I don't see a chiasm here. Well, okay. 1798 to 1844. Yeah. We have a movement that, as it begins, <coughs> begins to waken up the entire world. Mm -hmm. In 1989, we have a movement that begins to waken up a select group of people. It does not waken the entire world. Right. 
which has always been a problem this movement has tried to address. Well, this is why I'm, I'm saying in a chiastic type of way, one okay. wakens the entire world, the other wakens a small group. Okay. Now, see, the way that, that Jeff would have explained this is he says, well, this becomes this huge worldwide movement that gets smaller and smaller. And so his view was that our, we start with the small new movement that gets larger and larger. Which Correct. Is, right, within this line. So now, does that not represent a type of a chiasm? Yes. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say there. So, so that's why I didn't understand what you're talking about. Um, but now I understand what you mean. So it's just that it's it's a reverse of this history. And it's it is a repeat um, and enlarged. That is, what ends up happening is when we go through this history, when we go through this experience, we're going to unseal the seven thunders. Right? Because the seven thunders are sealed up. Right. And and we know that this relates to their disappointment. Now, Adventists would have believed that, well, once we understood the disappointment, the seven thunders are unsealed. But they're not. And, and we've never really addressed where what each of the seven thunders are and when they're unsealed. That is, the way that we looked at the seven thunders is we took those seven way marks on our line and just said those seven way marks are the seven thunders. But we kept moving them around, which shows that we didn't really understand them. And, but also, it, it came to me quite clear in 2000 and um, in 2018, at the beginning of 2018, when I did the paper on the Seven Thunders, um, addressing uh, Peter Plum's uh, paper on the Seven Thunders, where he rejected um, how we were doing the Seven Thunders, um, which way marks we were using because he didn't want to have midnight as a seven thunder. He had this theory about it. But as I really looked at Alan White's statements on Revelation 10, uh, it became really clear that the seven thunders are not seven way marks. We still have that position. I don't know if people basically understand what, what it is I was presenting, but my view was that the seven thunders are... Um, the un, that, that they're going to be sealed up. So we have the seven seals. All those seven thunders are sealed up. And their proclamations of a message in our time, um, and they do relate to the way marks in Millerite history, but they're not going to be, um, uh, how do I put this? Because I, I don't know if I ever explained it really well, or even if I understand it completely. But in our history, we pass through events, and when we pass through an event, then a waymark in Miller, Millerite history is then understood. So that's what Jeff was doing as he began to go through this history. So the first thunder that was unsealed would have been unsealed in the understanding of the time of the end. So when we understood that Daniel 11 verse 40 is addressing two times of the end, that's the basic idea that he had here, right? So he's going to understand the time of the end. Even though he's looking for the Sunday law, that's what he's focused upon. The reality is, he understands something that Lewis F. Weir didn't understand. Lewis F. Weir understood that Daniel 11, verse 40, is going to begin, um, that it's, it's going to be marking these events at the time of the end, right? So he's going to understand that uh, what happens in 1798 is verse 40. So this is Daniel 11 verse 40a, right? And Jeff is going to understand that this is Daniel 11, verse 40b, right? Mm -hmm. Is that what happens? Yes. So that's the most profound thing that happens, and that would be an unsealing of the seven thunders 
the first thunder. Would we agree on that? So it only relates to a way mark that is, there are things that are sealed up in Millerite history, but they're unsealed in our history. And they're unsealed as we pass through prophetic history. As Ellen White says, and, and I need to find that quote because I always I can never find it because I, I use the wrong words. I usually paraphrase it. But she says, basically, as we pass over the ground of fulfilled prophecy, those events will reflect back upon past events. Right. So we pass through 1989. We're now going to get an understanding of 1798. But the understanding of 1798 is then going to reflect or shine light into the future to give light for our feet. So the path ahead is understood as we pass through events because of past events. So that's that's this movement, right? So, so are we agreed upon that? That that's basically what's happening with this movement. Okay, so take your silent as a tacit agreement there. Now, then as we move through this history, so we got 1996, and this isn't lining up with what's above. We, we then are going to have an empowerment of the message. Now, how does 9-11 empower this message here? What specifically does 9-11 give us an understanding of that helps empower this message that's formalized here? Somebody's going to need to answer. I don't remember. Just think about it. It builds on the time of the end. Okay, so this this way mark here is an understanding of the time of the end. Mm -hmm. So in this history, we're going to have a way mark, 9-11, that's going to help establish Miller's history, right? Miller's message. Because Miller's going to have a message, right? His message, we say it's formalized in 1833. So the thing that empowers Miss Miller's message is August 11th, 1840. Mm -hmm. and, and this establishes the basic principle. So the principle that Miller is based upon is... The, the day for a year. So we'll say the year day principle. Right? Mm -hmm. The principle that's established here is that we are repeating Millerite history because now we have an event that parallels Millerite's hi Millerite history. So this is the end of the second woe. In our history, we have the beginning of the third woe. So this, this allows us to understand August 11th, 1840 as an empowerment of the first message. Hopefully people are following this because I, I dislike silence. Now, then what do we have next 
in our line. We need, now normally when you look at Millerite history, we look at what is next. And what is next is April 19th, 1844, right? The arrival of the second angel. But is that how Jeff first um, addressed this history? So can we create a line where the arrival of the second angel is something different than 9-11? That is, I want to create a line here that doesn't have two 9-11s. You see what what I'm trying to to establish here? That when we put 9/11 as two different waymarks, we were actually looking at two different lines. So just to review again, this this idea that Jeff has here, 1989, the Sunday law, the close of probation. This is his, his first line. And then he's going to have 9-11. So then he's going to end up with a waymark that looks, or, or um, a line that looks like this, 1989, 9-11, the Sunday law, right? That's going to be the second, that's going to be, I guess, the first emendation of his line, right? So he's going to amend his line to look like this. And then what's the third? What does he do next in, in his development of these lines? What's he going to put as the first way mark next? Now, one thing you'll see here is when he does this, he's recognizing that the close of probation is the Sunday law. The Sunday law is the close of probation for Adventists. When he's first doing this line, this is the first angel's message. This is the second angel's message. This is what Ellen White would have understood, except that he's he's taking this way mark of time at the end and putting it in as instead of 1798, he puts it as 1989. And so what he's doing, in a sense, is he's taking, when, when he's doing this, is he's taking this part of Millerite history, and he's, because um, he doesn't have here, he doesn't, in this history, okay, in this history, he's marking this as 1798. What is this paralleling in Millerite history? When Jeff is first looking at this line, how is he, what is he paralleling? He's going to have a close of probation. So this is going to parallel October 22nd, 1844. I don't know if anybody's following what I'm doing. So people need to talk. He's going to end up with this. I shouldn't say end up with. So this is going to be our understanding of the lines in 2015, this, this line. So what has Jeff done?
If you're thinking at all, you need to speak. <laughs> zoomed in? What's that? Okay, he's zoomed in. But exactly how has, has he zoomed in? That's what I don't think we, 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 we understand. Because when he does this, because remember, Ellen White has this big line. And Jeff says, we're repeating Millerite history. He's originally, this close of probation is just the close of probation, right, on Ellen White's line. This is Ellen White's line. The only difference is he's put this, this repeat of Millerite history prior to this line. So, so what he's done is he's taken this and he's zoomed into this, right? He said, no, the Sunday law is this. So once he has 9-11, he can now put a, a middle way mark here. And, and so when he does this and he says 9-11, 9-11 is August 11th, 1840, right? In this line. Right? Because this is 1798. This is August 11th, 1840. And then this becomes October 22, 1844. So I'm just going to do this. So 1798. So this is, of course, still 1798. This um, here is not a waymark in Millerite history per se. Right? He's just, he's just looking at this is the actual Sunday law. Right. So this this here, he knows that we're going to repeat Millerite history, but he hasn't really well defined how we repeat it. Back when he first creates this line, it's just that we're going to repeat. So he has this idea that the first and second angels messages that occurred in Millerite history are going to repeat in our history. So. You know, you would just say 1989, you're going to have the first and the second angel's message. This would be the third angel's message. So in some ways, he's lining this up with October 22. He just hasn't really well defined that. Now, when he gets here, you can see that he's going to have this as October 22, as the Sunday law, or at least 1844. This is August 11th. So he's going to see that this is uh, this this history of leading up to August 11th, but he hasn't really well defined what's happening in here. Once he gets the midnight cry, he starts to zoom into this history from August 11th, 1844. This is going to be 1842, um, basically to 44. And then this Sunday law here, because a lot of times he's going to talk about how, you know, the closing of the doors. So we're going to have this midnight cry. But this midnight cry is going to proceed the way that he understands it back here is this midnight cry originally is, is going to be this, this history that precedes 1844. So maybe I'll put this as 1842 and 1844. Something to that effect. But we start to get a better understanding of this. So then when he starts to understand that uh, this August 11th, 9-11 is the first day of the first month, whoops, the first day of the first month, and this is the first day of the fifth month, and this is the 10th day of the seventh month. He now has this being a 9-11 that is not August 11th, right? This is going to be April 19th. So what has he done when he, when he moves from this? So maybe what we should do is this would be August 11th. He's not just zooming in, in, in the normal sense that he has before. He's now going to see that this, these are two separate lines. I, I hope people can see that. What's well, two separate lines? This line and this line. Mm -hmm. Agreed. 
Okay, so when he zooms in, where is he zooming in? With this line based on this line. So that's what we don't understand, right? We don't understand our lines still. Because when he tries to combine these and say that both these 911s are the same way mark, he's actually looking at two different lines because this is not the same zoom in as this one. And so if we're gonna draw this line out, when is the arrival of the second angel in the context of this line? Because if 9-11 is the empowerment of the first angel, the arrival of the second angel is where? Because this is 9-11, right? So where is the arrival of the second angel in our history? If we're addressing this line. Hopefully you can see what I'm what I'm doing. I, I want you to think about it. Because what is the arrival of the second angel? Is it the same as the fourth angel? Yes. Okay. So we know that we have a line where this, the arrival of the second angel is 9-11. But in this line... What's the arrival of the second angel? Early on, when Jeff is seeing this as 9-11, what's the arrival of the second angel? If I did this, would that make sense? All of this looks logical. Okay, so this is actually how Jeff was thinking of it, right? But we don't know that back here, that, that really the Sunday law is the arrival of the second angel. So when we created 9-11 as the arrival of the second angel, we were actually on another line. Right. So now when we move to this line, this line is not just a zoom in in the set in the same sense that we would we would take. Well, this history, we're just looking at this history now. It actually is a different type of line. It's a different group of people. Right. And if it's a different line, it's addressing a specific darkness. Right. Okay. So that's where we we have failed um, in understanding the lines. Now, so when we move to 9-11 as being the first day of the first month, and so this is going to happen in, uh, you know, once we understand the first day of the first month is April 19th. So that's going to happen in 2014. And I can't remember exactly how that all unfolded. I mean, I remember sitting in uh, a study at Collins. So Colin had already moved and Tabo was there. And I was sharing what Jeff had shared regarding 9-11 uh, being the arrival of the second angel. And, and Tabo was arguing. And I said, well, this is just what Jeff is teaching. So, so I think it was in 2015 uh, that, that, that we had that study. So this would be early 2015. If I'm not mistaken, it might be even late 2014. But anyway, what we have is we have now a new line that's addressing a new period of the darkness, but we had never really defined it or understood it or saw how it works. So when Jeff was addressing with this history, even though we put 9-11 as the empowerment, 9-11 now has passed, he's still looking for the Sunday law as the next way mark. So he's still in a sense uh, 
in that that idea that the Sunday law is the arrival of the second angel. So if you have 9-11 as the empowerment of the first angel, you definitely have a different line. Now, we can put those two lines together. So what Jeff was saying is that we bring them together. And in a sense, there was nothing wrong with that. But what we have to see is that we, we actually are in a separate line. Where the Sunday law, now this Sunday law here is, is still a future event if this is the empowerment of the first angel. That is the Sunday laws after 9-11. Now, then we can put, you know, the loud cry here, and then we can put the close of probation here. But also what Jeff was doing when he, he, he starts to look at this, he does see that the Sunday law is a close of probation. So, so he's gradually moving into this new line. But now when we have... Um, if we're going to make 9-11 the, the arrival of the second angel, so I'm, I'm going to erase this stuff up here. So if we're going to, to create this new line, and so in this new line, we're going to have 9-11, uh, and that's the second angel arriving. We still need uh, a first angel arriving. We still need um, a formalization and, uh, and uh, um, other an message. empowerment. Empowerment, yeah. So formalization and empowerment of the message. And then what we do know about this line, when this is the arrival of the second angel, that what we have done is we have then put over here the Sunday law, but we, we ended up with these other way marks, midnight and midnight cry. Right. So so we've always put that we're in this history prior to midnight. That is, we've we've not come to this way mark yet. Now we could just, you know, we could just take this line and take all of this and put it up here. Right? So so we could just take this, we could put the same way marks here. And that's basically what we've always that that's what we've been doing, right? We've been just taking this history. This is um, the first angel's message, and we just put it here. So again, we put, you know, 96. Um, 9-11 and then we put you know 1989 okay but is there something else that we could do What if we just did this? All right. That would be an interesting thought process. Well, that's what we've already done. No, I, I get it. <laughs> but how many, how many times have we really addressed it in this way? Well, we haven't, not in this way. So really, when we look, because we already know, don't we know 11-9 is the first day of the first month? We do. Right? But because of our perspective at the time, prior to 
November 9th, doesn't it actually serve the same function that we had when it came to 9-11 prior to 9-11? So November 9th becomes this really important waymark that is the arrival of the second angel's message in this line, right? Yes. Okay. So here, the Sunday law was the arrival of the second angel's message. It was something future, right? But we were looking at, you know, we were looking at this line prior to 9-11 is we didn't see 9-11. Once 9-11 passed, we saw it was the empowerment of the first angel. So here we can see that in this case, 9-11 is still the empowerment of the first angel, right? Um, this is still the formalization. And this is still the time of the end. So all of this history that was unfolding, we, we, we start to see as we pass through it, we start to understand really this way mark. So saying that 9-11 was the arrival of the second angel is in a sense true because our whole history is the history of the Sunday law, right? But the Sunday law is the, the arrival of the second angel. So as we get closer, we start to we start to see the purpose of these waymarks. So eleven nine is the arrival of the second angel's message. So so all we have to do is flip those two numbers around, which we've already shown are are equal to each other. Okay, so hopefully this this helps click it in our minds of where we are on the lines. And, but see, we, we just, I mean, we were zooming into a way mark with, with 11.9, but that's, but, but once, once Jeff had made, had combined these two, he didn't really understand what that meant. That means, for this movement, we now have this special line that we can do. So when Jeff had this line, let's put it this way. So Jeff had a line in 2016 that was 9-11, midnight, midnight cry, Sunday law. We now have this line, 11-9, midnight, midnight cry, Sunday law. And when we look at this line, we, we still haven't fully understood it yet, but we know that this, that this starts that, that 777 seven structure. So if we, we, we put this in here and how we have that structure, we would have November 9th, right? Now, November 9th, we, 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 we tried to put November 9th as midnight. That is, it's going to be raffia, right? But we also saw that, saw that November 9th was the first day of the first month. We agree with that, right? So the first day of the first month, month can't possibly be midnight. So we're obviously looking at different lines at different times. I would have to say that that's a logical conclusion. Okay. And, and, and so these are the things that we, we need to sort out as we go through and understand this, the history of the judges and how it relates to our line so that we know specifically what line we're looking at. And that's what I believe that, that we're, we're still struggling with and we will, we will have to complete, right? We'll have to complete the understanding of these lines. Now, the vast majority of our movement right now isn't looking at any of this at all. And so the responsibility that we have is first to understand this and to be able to share it, because this is the only way we can sort out our history. And, and this may seem, well, this is kind of an intellectual exercise, but it isn't just an intellectual exercise. 
Because as we've been going through the story of the judges, we've been going through a personal transformation of recognizing our weaknesses and our sins. And, and Christ is doing a work upon our hearts. And now we know that Samuel Snow, and, that, and that's going to be part of where we end up really getting to understand things, is the role of Samuel Snow. So what that means. Now, one of the things that Jeff and I had problems with is if we look at this line here, um, we know that we had 9-11 as the arrival of the second angel. But now I put 11-9 there. And Samuel Snow comes after 9-11. That is, his message is an increase of light after August 11th, 1840. That's going to prepare us for midnight, right? So this is going to be July 18th, right? This is going to be February 16th, right? So this is snow, okay? And you can see that the first day of the first month being 11-9, that, that it's the arrival of the second angel's message, and snow has a message that, that happens after August 11th, 1840, based upon Miller's understanding of things, your day principle, all these different things that Miller was teaching. But before this disappointment, he's going to be presenting this message. And then he's gonna present it three days before midnight. And then at midnight, it's going to be midnight. He proclaims it's midnight. And then he's gonna have these 25 days until the midnight cry. And then he's going to have, I um, can't remember how many days it is. Um, but from here to here, it's going to be 93 days. I believe it is. I can't remember correctly. Yeah. So, so we have this. Anyway, those, that's not that important. What we see here is that this is snow. But snow uh, relates to our history. And that's where we're going to have to really define how we place snow in our history. That is, it's a message if we're going to um, somehow fit it in. It fits between 9-11 and 11-9 that he's going to be give, preparing this message. So then we're going to have to decide you know, how we fit that together. Okay. So I think that was a useful exercise, even though it was painful. <clears throat> okay. So when we get back to, to understanding these lines, <clears throat> I'm just going to go down here. And you can see then, see how we have uh, the Oklahoma camp meeting. In, in our understanding is these two different way marks, the empowerment of the first and the arrival of the second, though they are separate dates. So they're not quite the same way mark. But that's because we have Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar placed together on a line as the arrival of the first angel and the increase of knowledge prior to the formalization of the message on this line. This is a bigger line. This line goes from 9-11 now, if we look at this line here, um, this there's nothing wrong with this line. But it is a mixture of two lines to some degree. That is, each of these way marks are themselves a line. So there's nothing wrong with placing this line like this, except to understand that November 9th itself has its own line. 
this history here dealing with um, October 13th to September 7th, 2019, so 18 and 19, that this itself has its own line, that this itself has its own line, and that Othniel himself has his own line. And so this, this story of Othniel, this work of the Holy Spirit, so that's what we're trying to address here today. If we go back to our study, to the scriptures here, So here we are. Judges chapter 3, verse 7. <clears throat> now the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot the Lord their God and served Balaam in the grove. So remember, there's a doubling here. But this doubling is a mixture of church and state. Balaam being this masculine God and Asherah being this feminine God. So this is a Phoenician goddess. Now, Balaam is, is a Canaanite god. And this is a Phoenician goddess. Right? Agreed. Okay. Now, <clears throat> so the period of darkness here is what? Now, remember, the oppressor is going to be Kushrashathayim, king of Mesopotamia, right? And they're going to serve him for 18 years. But what is the darkness itself? I mean, it's Balaam and Asherah, but how do we... Address this darkness. One way of looking at it is it's a rejection of light that they'd already had. Okay. But you're also dealing with a, a generational situation. Right. Yeah. So so they've they've rejected the light that God has given them regarding worship. Right. Um, you know, so in this literal sense for them. For us, what is it? Again, in this with, with Othniel, <clears throat> wouldn't this be the rejection of Miller's rules with the okay. church? Yeah, so it's the rejection of Miller's rules. Um. Right, so we're following the Protestant system of Bible study. Right. And, and, and I would say that Balaam primarily represents that. Asherah re represents the spiritualism of, you know, the spiritual exercise, whatever they call it, spiritual formation. Right, but it, which really is spiritual exercise. That, that is... To understand spiritual formation, what it is, is it's using the external sort of, it's a type of self-hypnosis. To make you think that you're a Christian when you're not. Does that make sense to people? Okay, if we, if we look at the example with the children of Israel. Yeah. At this point, they knew that they were under a theocracy. Mm -hmm. Yet they were making the choice to accept Balaam and accept the Ashtaroth. Yeah. So <clears throat> what were they, you know, technically, what were they doing? Well, they were rejecting God. Were they not walking by sight? And not by faith. Yeah. They wanted things that they could see. So spiritual formation has many different um, manifestations. 
I mean, the basic idea of, of spiritual formation is, you know, you adopt the language of faith, you get to understand the forms. It's a form of godliness without the power of God. It's, it's washing the outside of the cup. It's whitening a sepulcher that still is full of dead man's bones. And, and so what we have done in Adventism is we will, we will look at the church and we'll say, well, see, the church accepted spiritual formation, but I haven't. The church is Laodicean, but I'm not. But we haven't understood what, what true and false worship is. False worship is the Pharisee going up to give his, his, you know, prayer to God, you know, saying, I'm thankful I'm not like other men are. You know, I fast twice in the week and give tithes of all that I possess. And I'm not like this other guy here, this publican. Now, we can see it in the Pharisee, but we can't see it in ourselves. So this work of the Holy Spirit is the work of convincing of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father. And of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. And soon shall he be cast out. As Ellen White adds the two different verses together at the end there. Right? So we know... That the work that needs to be done is, is this individual work of repentance, confession, right? So that would be, um, uh, well, conviction, confession, and repentance, I guess. We put it in that order. So you, the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. We confess our sins. And then we turn from those sins. That's the work that has to happen, that isn't happening in our lives, right? This is what God is bringing us to, that we need this work of the Holy Spirit. Now, so when we deal with, with Othniel, and we say that Othniel, so if we go back here, um, and what I suggested is that Othniel begins earlier. That is, in order to get to 9-11, you need this work of the Holy Spirit of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And But I'm saying it can start, I mean, in a sense, can start almost anywhere, right? Depends on which line you're looking at. But as far as 9-11 is concerned, if we're going to say that this is the repentance that is needed in this history, Othniel, Right. And, and this is Othniel, Ehud and Shamgar. So, um, I mean, this 9-11, in a sense, is a different particular darkness uh, than this. I mean, this has to be, to some degree, a personal darkness. Primarily. That is, in order to become a part of this line, you have to experience Othniel. But also, we could say that Othniel goes all the way back to 1798 or to anywhere along the line previous. So Othniel is a difficult one if we're going to say, well, when does Othniel arrive? And, and so the way that I think that I would address this, and maybe I'm wrong on this, but I would say that Othniel is primarily a personal experience that is in order to be a part of any of this even though you know we're putting off Neil at the beginning but if you're going to be a part of any of this the judges line you need this work of the holy spirit and in a sense we could take off Neil and put him everywhere right because we're not all here at 9-11. It is the preparatory message 
in order to become a part of this line. Now, as far as the movement is concerned, um, we still could take this line of Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar, right? Because that's going to be the first judge, right? The first waymark, the arrival of the first message. But as far as Othniel is concerned himself, <coughs> this is really, if we take him out as a separate line, this is just a personal line. Agreed. Okay. <clears throat> But it can start anywhere as far as as these other lines. That is, Othniel has this place um, at the beginning of this line. But it's something that leads up to being able to be a part of this line, or really technically a part of this line. But it can happen anywhere. You don't have to be here at 9-11 and have had this experience. Othniel is going to permeate this entire line, because this increase of light, remember, this increase of light is the work of the Holy Spirit. And so no matter where we are in this line, we can experience Othniel. He can take us away from that self-righteousness where we believe in right righteousness that we can see in ourselves only, and that's going to be only external righteousness, because None of us are really going to see internal righteousness. We're going to see the evil of our heart. We're going to just have an external righteousness that we can show others. And we, we're going to have a belief that that is sufficient. As long as other people see us as righteous, we must be righteous. If we can see our external acts conforming to some kind of standard that we have set for ourselves... Right. That is that that spiritualism living up to a standard that we have set. Do as thou willeth or whatever it is the Satanists say. Can't remember how they word it. But that's really how we live. So we set up a standard of righteousness that we can meet, that other people can't, so we can judge them or really judge ourselves as better than them because we've set up some particular points that are easy for us that might be hard for others. We can then compare ourselves with others and think of ourselves as better than others and, and as if that's sufficient because who are we to pair, compare ourselves to, right? And I've, and I've used this illustration many times, you know, when it comes to guitar players who are really good they don't compare themselves to guitar players who are bad. They compare themselves to the guitar players who are better than them and judge themselves as inferior, which is why they're good guitar players, because they're pushing themselves to a higher standard than they themselves can meet. But if they just compared themselves to people who couldn't play guitar, oh, they'd be amazing guitarists, right? But that's but they wouldn't get better, right? They would be satisfied with something less. And that's how we are. God has offered us a high standard, higher than the human, highest, you know, higher than the human thought can reach. And yet we're satisfied with this low standard, just to be better in our own mind than those around us. And yet those around us that we think we're better than who see themselves as sinners and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Those are the ones that go down to their houses justified rather than us. <clears throat> okay. So, so we dealt with Othniel. And so what we need to understand about Othniel is that Othniel is a necessary preparatory work of the Holy Spirit so that we can even begin on our line at all. If we don't have that, we're not part of these lines, even though we may have been in this movement even prior to 9-11. Okay, 
So we're going to begin looking at Ehud. So I'm just going to put Ehud here. So, because we didn't really write anything uh, dealing with Othniel. So if we get, look at he, Ehud now, Ehud is also going to have a line, but this line's a lot more complicated. Now the, rest, the land had rest 40 years, and then we get Ehud. So one of the things about Ehud that's interesting is it comes after a period of 40 years. And what would be the significance of that? Can the 40 years in the wilderness represent a period of darkness? Certainly. Yeah. And now, this, of course, is the land had rest 40 years, but we're just going to use the fact that Ehud occurs after a period of 40 years. So again, you know, we play, place Ehud in the line of the judges as the arrival of the first message. But when we look at the arrival of the first message itself, Ehud is the arrival of the second angel's message. Now, Ehud, we primarily have looked at as a message relating to uh, the 2520. But it's it's also the second angel's message in this context when we're looking at the, at the line of Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. But now we have Ehud's own line itself. And... Um, so here, where it says, the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. And he gathered unto him the children of Ammon and Amalek, and went and smote Israel, and possessed the city of the palm trees. So we know that this is the issue dealing with Jericho. And so we put Ehud in, well, the way, the way that we put Ehud in the arrival of the first message um, uh, so let me go back here. So we put Ehud as um, November 14th, 2010. So, so we already had, um, so the arrival of the second message. So we, we put Ehud as, as the arrival of the first message in the line of the judges itself. But in, when we have Ethnia, Uhud, and Shamgar, we have Ehud as being the Oklahoma camp meeting November 14th, 2010. That's where, what we did, whether that's correct or not. So when we put Ehud, though, as a separate line, um, this darkness would have to relate to an understanding of the 2520. So it would just simply be, we don't understand the 2520, and then an understanding of the 2520 comes to this movement. And so we usually put that as 2005. Right? So that would that be the simplest way to look at Ehud? Probably. Okay. So whenever we don't understand the 2520, and then we do come to understand the 2520, now Jeff places that as 2005, and then he marks seven years until Newport, right? So, so we'll have to figure out what Newport is on this line because it would be on this line. So we would just say that in Ehud, we don't have an understanding of the 2520. And, and then simply we would just have uh, that the 2520 would arrive, right? So I'm just going to put here. Uh, So whatever year that is, whatever date. You know, we can decide on that later, but we're just going to say the 2520 arrives to this movement. 
Now, when it arrives to this movement, it, it does arrive gradually. So we're gonna get a formalization of this message at some point. So, so we don't know these dates yet. We're gonna work on this tomorrow. And then we're gonna have an empowerment of that. Now, I think there I can put the empowerment of that. Um, so I'm just gonna copy this. Oops. And I'm gonna say that this is going to be Newport. So what, it, now Newport has to be in here somewhere. But then when it comes to, um, you know, and, and this might even be maybe Parminder's presentations or something on the 2520s of 2010. You know, if I did this, maybe I'll do this here. Because this is when, um, so we'll just put here 2010, whatever, you know, we decide the dates are for that. <clears throat> but then we're going to have a, a form, the, 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 the arrival of the second angel's message. Okay, so that's going to be, um, so what would, so we have this message in power, we have 2012, but now we need an arrival of the second angel's message. So that is, we have the 2520 here. It's formalized, it's empowered, right? This movement is now labeled the 2520 movement, right? That's how it's going to be labeled by its enemies. But then we have a second angel arrive. Now, what would the second angel have to address? Coming away from the teachings of Babylon that had been accepted. Okay. But remember, this is in our movement itself as well. Right. Okay, I'm still sharing the Bible, they say, so I need to switch over to here. Yeah, there we go. So you can see now what I drew in there. Um, so within this movement, we get an understanding of the 2520. We become labeled as a 2520 movement. But Ehud is, and, and remember here too, this is still the arrival of the first angel's message in our history. So when we go up, you know, to this, this is something that's leading us up to the formalization of the first angel's message. And that's going to be um, October 13th and, and September 7th that we have here is marking the formalization of this message having to do with time setting, right? Because this line here, the line of the judges is about time. <clears throat> so remember what we're zoomed into. So we're zoomed into though this first message and, um, and this is gonna be the second angel's message. So we have here 2005 and 2014 as this increase of light that is the formalization and then we put here 2014 as the empowerment. So that's going to be what happens in the movement, which is going to lead to this. <clears throat> um, all right. So this is like a, a separate line here. <clears throat> like a, Even though this is the formalization and empowerment, this is within this line. <clears throat> So it's, it's the mini line uh, that we have here. Of, so it's going to lead us to 2014. Um, but Ehud himself, this is going to lead us somewhere. Right? So Ehud is still going to lead us to this history somewhere. Now, any, any other thoughts on how we address Ehud? Because remember, he's, he's a zoom into this line. 
right? He's to this second angel. But he's going to extend up to this history. But you can see we've already moved him past where he is here, right? So in this line, Ehud is the second angel's message, and his formalization is Newport. But here, in this line of Ehud, his empowerment is Newport. So you can see how we've separated out these lines. So when does the second angel arrive? Because this is this is the first angel. This is a testing message of the 2520. Right? So this is about the 2520. And so this history here is going to address the 2520 in our movement. So what's the second angel? Okay, so what if we, um, did this. Um. Okay, so this is Sylvan Lake, Alberta, 2013. What happens at Sylvan Lake in 2013? That would be the arrival of the second angel. So Jeff comes to Sylvan Lake, Alberta, with a message on the four seven times. And I come to Sylvan Lake, Alberta, with a message on the four seven times. Now, I'd been working on a paper for about three or four weeks prior to the Sylvan Lake camp meeting. So my understanding of this is is still pretty new, but I end up presenting the idea that there are four seven times, and that's gonna be Manasseh, Manasseh's captivity, um, Daniel's captivity in Jehoiakim's third year, Jehoiachin's captivity, and Zedekiah's captivity. So I'm gonna mark these four events, and Jeff marks the exact same four events. Now, how does this relate to the 2520? And why would I, I mean, obviously it's Leviticus 26, but how does this relate? What is it that we are now being tested on? We, we're benefited by the first message. So we've accepted the 2520, but now what's gonna happen in our understanding of the 2520? Did Miller, under, Miller understand the four seven times? Did he ever address the progressive captivity of literal Judah? No, he had not. No. So he just addresses 677. Right. I mean, he does address Northern Israel. Um, he takes 722, I think it is. And, you know, he counts 25, 20 years to 1798. And he just mentions it in passing for the most part, that there was 25, 20 years for Northern Israel. But when it comes to Judah, he just skips a step. He starts with 677 and he just says they're under captivity and it's going to be for 25, 20 years and it ends in 1844. Now, when Jeff and I both come to this camp meeting at Sylvan Lake, with the same message, that's a doubling, right? Agreed. 
Now there's also a next, another message that arrives there as well. So Jeff comes with a message and says, um, we're studying and trying to understand when the midnight cry was given in 1844, what date it was given, because we have this understanding of Ezra 7-9 that's been brought to our attention. And this idea is that the first day of the first month, they leave Babylon, Ezra does, and then he arrives at Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month. Now, Jeff, uh, the way that he explained it is we have um, 120 days from the first day of the first month to the first day of the fifth month. That is four months, four times 30 is 120. And then we have 70 days from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month. Now, Jeff doesn't know that there's 29 and a half days in a month. He just accepts that the Jews use the 30 day month on their calendar, which isn't the case. Um, they used a 29 and a half. So it'd be sometimes 29 days, sometimes 30 days. So I told Jeff this and he didn't know this, right? So this was news to him, but they were trying to figure this out. Now it's not gonna be until 2014 that we're gonna have this message formalized. So, so we have another message that's coming, right? So even though we have this 2520 and we're saying that that's Ehud, it's also going to be um, in 2014 that we get this understanding of this other message that Jeff gives. So there's a doubling of the message. Now, of course, this becomes extremely important to understand the first day of the first month. So, um, so I'm going to say that the empowerment of this message is going to happen in 2015. Now, well, maybe what we could do here, maybe that's the arrival. Anyway, so we have this, maybe I'm, I could put this October. So here, I'll do it this way. Okay, so I could do this, and maybe this is the right way to do it. Um, so we have two different, we have a formalization of a message. So in Sylvan Lake, we have the two, um, these two that are happening, the two presentations in the four, seven times we're going to have in, and we're going to look at this tomorrow because our time is up. And then June 22nd, 2014, uh, we're going to have this message formalized, this part of it. And, and maybe in some ways we could almost look at like two different messages, but I'm going to present and, and this would be October 20th to 21. So this is me presenting um, time, right? Chronology in at that camp meeting. But then we would have to decide where the third angel arrives and what that is. And what I would do, we're going to show tomorrow. So, so we'll look at this. You know, again, I put a lot of things on here. I don't get a lot of criticism, um, but I want people to think about this critically on how we would understand Ehud. Because if this is the 2520, this has to do with the development of the 2520 in our message. But it is also connected to the first day of the first month and the first day of the fifth month and which is a chronology part of that message. So the 2520 gets brought together here in this history of Ehud. So anyway, I want you to think about it. And we're going to end here. So let's close with prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, again, we thank you for the time we've had here. We just pray, Lord, that we can think about these things, that we can understand them, that we can reproduce um, these studies in sharing them with others. And we pray that you can help us to prepare the studies for the summer. We pray for the camp meeting plans. 
uh, that they will be according to thy will at a time that those who would benefit most will be able to be there. And that you can bless each person in this movement who is seeking to understand truth. Help us to follow and serve you is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.